So as we continue to examine ways in which technology can be deployed to address our most challenging problems, I'd like to turn the conversation to healthcare, particularly uh, this week as we engage or do not engage in a great national debate about the role of the federal government in offering health care to the country. So our next guest, Jonathan Bush, who is the CEO and the founder of Athena Health, has joined us here today to talk about his passion for bringing better effectiveness, better price controls to health care in the cloud. Jonathan Bush. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you again. How's it going? Uh, it's going very well. Hi, everybody. Jonathan Bush. Um, you could have Rally gone into crap, almost any buddy. business you wanted. Why did you choose healthcare? Uh, my uh, fantasy was that I would be doing some romantic uh, good. So originally, I was going to be a surgeon or something, and you know, like on TV, uh, and, and save people's lives. And in fact, a, a surgeon friend said, uh, first of all, you're not very good in school, and second of all, <laughs> it's actually not like that all the time, and why don't you get a job in healthcare before you go and devote 10 years of your life, and I actually got a job driving an ambulance in New Orleans, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was fabulous, uh, best $9.35 an hour job I ever had, um, but what I discovered was that as a medic, I could do sort of 30 things on every single patient, it was just one of the 30, right, mm -hmm. one of which was drive to the hospital, um, and uh, and then when I got there, there was a doctor, a fellow, or an, or an attending, who could do like 130 things. The only thing is, he'd been doing it for like 15 years. And I thought to myself, even if I got through organic chemistry, could, w would I end up sort of sucking my exhaust pipe after 15 years of doing the same 130 things? And so I became more obsessed with the idea of how do you distribute the, how do you connect patients to the care they need rather than rumble them through the streets to this one guy who's exhausted banging out these 130 things. It can't be that that's the only guy who could do all of those things. Uh, when I went to the army, it was actually the same thing. But in the army, they sort of started to distribute care. So you, as a medic, you had a smart book. Mm -hmm. And you could do things that in civilian society, a, 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 you know, somebody who makes... $12,000 a year would never be allowed to do, but you could actually do them better than the doctors because you were cranking them out all day long. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of an algorithm-based care uh, uh, as, as a model for making it cheaper and actually better um, for the routine parts of care uh, became sort of an obsession. And So t talk a bit about that for the, for the audience. Sure. Chat with them about what Athena Health does um, and why it had such an amazing IPO and why it has been become such a successful business in an area that often doesn't have many success stories. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I really want to talk about why there are not a lot of success stories, but uh, uh, we'll Athena, Athena yeah. does uh, scut work that doctors hate and suck at. Uh, basically, if you, if you do the Clay Christensen job to do, right? We love our technology and we love our business model, but really what we do is we're the water boy come water man who goes around behind the doctor and does their claims and their forms and their meaningful use attestation and their patient reminders and their collections and their blah, 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 all this stuff. They're like, I did not go to medical school to do, right? Yeah. Uh, and so there's five services now from billing to medical records, care coordination, patient communication. Uh, and it's a cloud-based service. The business model is give us it. The software is free. It's like Amazon. The, the software is the store into which you go mm. to get the service, which is the job done, whatever that may be. You know, your cool red sneakers delivered in the mail or your claim paid or your patient given the results that they need. And so we charge a percentage of the work that we do uh, so you don't have to pay a lot. You don't have to invest a lot in something that may become obsolete. And as we get paid, as you get paid more and better and faster, Athena gets paid more and better and faster. So that's the basic company. And the theory, so that's what we do. What we secretly think we're doing, yeah. and don't tell anyone or write it down or record it or anything, but huh. we think we're building the healthcare internet. So what we think we're doing is creating the conditions where there can be innovation in healthcare. Healthcare does experience innovation because of the caring and love and sponsorship and the places like MIT that invest in it, but really the conditions are not there. You know, the conditions for innovation in any real way Why not? Why are, not? 
Well, you, had, you need many buyers, many sellers, and freedom for them to shop for each other, yeah. right? I want the deluxe. I want the gourmet. I want my health care with spinners so I can pick up chicks at the bar with it. Or I hate it. I don't want any of it. I want to fire it and keep the money and put it into my real estate, yeah. right? You're not allowed. I mean, you know, we, we're now at, what, 25% of the life work of the median American is taken from them by force, you know, and, 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 and put into a product that they can't fire. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that that disequilibrium between, you know, job to do and expense of the job has, has created an environment where, you know, the usual disruptive technology curve is not there. So, you know, all the great stuff that we use and enjoy today, our iPhones, our, 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 our music, you know, it started as some crappy product that only idiots would buy, right? Uh, but the idiots weren't able to buy the established products. So, well, it's better than nothing, so I'll buy it. And then over time, you know, it iterated and iterated, and more and more people said, well, I really don't need the gourmet because the crappy one's actually pretty good. And pretty soon, the crappy one's better than the gourmet one. It's whether it's PCs and digital equipment or mini mills and maxi mills or transistor radios versus you know, vacuum stereos. All of the great innovations, all of the vertical learning curves have come from the crazy ones sitting outside of the establishment saying, well, I'll take this piece of shit better than the expensive mainstream thing. How you does... can't do that in healthcare. You must have an all-you-can-eat buffet of everything, you know, on through to stage four cancer care that actually kills you faster, you know, or you can have nothing at all. So how does Athena um, allow people, right. uh, doctors or healthcare providers or hospitals to have choices which they do not have in the current system? Right. So in all of these examples, there's only one variable, which is how much does it cost? You know, and you can sort of, there's some sort of subjective variable. Did I like it? You know, I'm not sure whether people say, did I like my steel or not? But, they, you know, they like their phones and their radios. And, and, and so what Athena's trying to do is create in a very constrained and complicated environment, some of, those in, some of those shopping conditions. So one is information transparency. You register once in any practice around the country, we got you, you know? There's 40 million patient records in AthenaNet. You're not gonna get missed or duplicated or lost or shuffled mm -hmm. anymore. And how many people walk up to a doctor's office and get the same freaking clipboard from the same freaking guy that they got it last time, right? Or get referred for an image. And you're like, okay, well, will you, no, no, here's the card, call them up, bye-bye. And you go there, and there's the damn clipboard again, right? And these are, by the way, places that have multi-hundred million dollar computer systems. It's a great story. I'll, I don't know how much time I have, but I'm going and I'm watching it. this hospital. I'm working for an ambulance company, and we, I want to connect the whole continuum, right? I want our healthcare internet to follow. So we have the ambulance company. We don't have the hospital. We don't have the nursing home. So I ride in the ambulance up, and Betty is going to get out and be transferred to the nursing home, and I want to follow it. This hospital has just spent $250 million in three years installing a very big computer system, what we might call a computer system of epic proportions, big. And we get there, and we have a very elaborate medical record system that I'm trying to displace, but anyway, it's a nice one. And what happens but the emergency room prints out a 47-page printout of the $200 million. And we take it, and we put it under Betty's legs. We roll her in, roll her to the nursing home. And then when Betty's not on the stretcher, we then print, we, we type the key things from this thing into this thing. And then we hit send, and our central medical records department faxes our transcription of the printout to the nursing home who puts it in a beautiful binder to be transcribed later that night into the, you know, <laughs> mother of pearl. And this is a thing that just went live. And so what we're trying to do is find a business model and a technology approach that allows everybody to see what's available uh, and, 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 and A, not lose the obvious stuff and duplicate it. But then if everything's on there and the registration and the basic documentation of federally acquired information fades into the sort of metadata, then you can start to say, well, that one's more expensive. That one, you know, treats me regularly. That one's just as good, but, but, but half as much. Th those are the kinds of things that we can start to tease out of the muck if, if we can get enough information continuity. So that's the, I don't know if I just over no, Well, no, you know you did. So if, you, you can always over answer on stage here. Um, so if there are many problems with the American healthcare system, but one of them has traditionally been described as its opacity. So the simplest Correct. level, one of the things the Athena healthcare system does is it, it brings a degree of transparency to oh. exchanges otherwise do not exist. That's right. 
That's right. And so what we're trying to do, so if everybody was on Athena now, that'd be one solution. And for a while in our arrogance and excitement, we thought maybe that would be the solution. And then, you know, 16 years later, we've gotten to four whole percent of the doctors in the country. I'm thinking maybe we need a new plan. Huh. So now it's possible for doctors to friend other institutions that aren't on AthenaNet and say, well, can we at least have either an API or can you look at an online log of what's going back and forth? You know, can we have some lighter connection? And that's going very well. Some of it's illegal, so we had to go to the office of the inspector general, which doesn't really sound like an American institution, but it is. It's a real thing. It's not in a Kafka novel. Uh, and we have a special memo of approval to you know, do this. Uh, but, that's, but, but the idea is, and, and the big question for kind of this MTech in, in the healthcare sense is, how can we get, how can we chisel not just technology and invention and brilliance, but a business model that allows for the trial and error and, fa trial, trial and, error and failure that is necessary to, to grow up these technologies? How is Athena Health adapting to the growth of mobile health? It's producing more data. Right. It's involving individuals more. Right. Uh, there are movements like patients like me, where patients share information. Yep. Yeah. So, so we are still. So that's a really cool post Star Wars trilogy, and we're in Star Wars one. You know, these are not the droids <laughs> you're looking for. We're so far back. So right now, Athena is literally, this was a hospital that was a quarter of a mile away from the nursing home that are in the same system that we were, uh, I was just describing. So that's where most of the Athena work goes. What's exciting to me is that outside of the healthcare ecosystem, the established permitted healthcare environment, the instrument itself, RayAge, um, is, is creating blossoms of technology that is vastly superior to the approved and regulated sort of inside the biosphere technology. And that's really exciting because all of this is about, you can't have a healthcare internet if you have to keep typing stuff into it, right? The point of the internet is you look it up and it's already been typed in somewhere else, right? I had this great experience when I first went to India. So there's a room of a thousand, they're all women for some reason, but they were in beautiful saris and, and there's one screen which is like a home video camera of a car driving down a road and the other is a data entry screen and the ladies are turning the knob and it speeds up the tape of the thing and then they stop and then they back up the tape and then they stop and then they put some stuff in there. They were typing in all the road signs in Germany. Uh, uh, to create the maps that we now take for granted. But somebody actually had to type that shit in at one point, <laughs> right? And that's a, sort of a devastating thought, right? We assumed it came from somewhere, but it doesn't. They, they actually recorded all the roads. And so we're kind of in that place right now, is chiseling into these, you know, flock of seagulls era computer systems and trying to pull <laughs> the data out in its mangled, scrambled mumps forms. But meanwhile, outside of the regulated, established, um, healthcare system, people are instrumenting themselves in much more readable, malleable ways. And I think that that's going to be the break, right? That people will not need to go down for their MRI because they will have developed some home-based thing that was used by runners with shin splints, right? And it's just as good. And somebody with a risk contract will say, you know what, just send me a blast of your, you know, self-tube and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I'll have a little signal noise ratio thing. And anytime you get out of control, I'll call you. Those are the kinds of things that I think are really, really, really close that don't need permission, you know, because that takes forever, um, that could start to happen and, and, and that probably someone in this room will, you know, come up with, God willing, knock on plastic. But until that happens, Athena Health is still relatively dependent on doctors or healthcare providers yes. entering the data. And That's right. And they're, they're, they're famously undesiring by your own admission of doing so. So do you care what the input is and how do you manage? Yes, we have to, right? Yeah. Now, you know, the nice thing about a cloud-based network is once you get a pipe into some place, you never need to go back, right? So once we got Aetna figured out, we never need to go back to Aetna. And anybody who ever, you know, any claim that we figure out why did that Aetna claim get denied for that thing, we go through the five whys, we build the rules engine out. Nobody ever gets that denial from that or nobody gets that identity wrong from Aetna ever again, right? So the same thing is now true on a smaller scale. Once you get a pipe into the Epic system at Partners, you never need to go back. You can always not duplicate that one thing for anybody who gets on the network ever again. Then the next wave will be, you know, once you get this EKG machine set up, right? And so little by little by little, you move down the, yeah. the spectrum to more and more and more low volume sources of information. So ultimately you get, you know, the self. You'll get people's iPhones saying, yeah, I'll let you use my Facebook account to update your demographics file or something like that. Um, that. That's the way it's trickling down. And, you know, I, my sense is that the inside out work is so bloody exhausting that we won't get there in time and that probably something from an outside in perspective will be the thing that gives us the break we need if we're not going to have kind of a black swan 
failure of a lot of healthcare. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to take some questions from the audience in a second, but I'm going to prompt uh, Jonathan, who is on the, the front lines, as it were, of yep. seeing how doctors, healthcare providers, and businesses are responding to the American Care Act. So Affordable what have Care, you, yeah. What have you seen with ACA? Uh, well, uh, so we, uh, we healthcare establishment types, it's sort of depressing that I now I think I have to say I'm established, um, even though I sort of prefer the self-image of being an annoying little gnat on the outside. Mm -hmm. But we just blew it. You know, we, we are a largely, you know, we are, the, we're a majority rural country, and when the 80% stay still for a long time and can't, can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it, eventually they say to the government, go take it for me. And that's what happened. So the Affordable Care Act didn't make it affordable at all. They just took the money and said, here, you have to have it. Um, and that's too bad. But anyways, shame on us. You know, shame on our teaching institutions that declare their missions to be so important that they can jack up prices for so many years in a row. And shame on all of, sorry, but it's true, you know. Uh, all of the behaviors that we sort of got away with in this, oh, it's an entitlement, oh, it's a national good, it's a public good, um, is now coming home to roost. And I don't blame it. Administration works for the people. And people said, I want more, you know. I want a piece of that. Um, it's too bad because that, that 40 million people would have been the people who would have created the less, you know, the demand for the lesser product that would have risen up and been the technologically superior product over time and obsoleted the current all-you-can-eat buffet of interventions that we call healthcare today. So I don't blame. It's okay. It's just what it is. It just makes it harder for disruptive technologies to be born inside the insurance product space. It's not too late. I mean, you know, in the papaka, you get, you get four choices, right? You can have, you ever see that ad with the night wear, and then the lady walks out with a flashlight in the same suit as the day wear, and then it's just beach wear, she walks out in the same suit with a beach ball? Anyway, the products are identical. The platinum, the gold, it's just, you can have anything you want, you pay for 10% of it, 20% of it, 30% of it, 40% of it. So there's not gonna be much product management, but maybe there's gonna be product management inside the delivery system. Maybe a doctor will get a risk contract and say, I'm only gonna go to you if you can show me this performance results, or I'm only going to go to you if you then guarantee to not send a claim for any reoperations after that. That is the beginning. That's all still possible inside of the Affordable Care Act, and that could actually lead to affordability. So that's where I'm focusing on, is how to deliver the same sort of undifferentiated product in more creative ways and get doctors to start shopping. And that's all allowed and encouraged under the current form. Do your clients and your business partners understand it? Ah, uh, well, they do like it when we just do the stuff they hate and stink at. I mean, well, well, do they understand yeah. the American Care Act? Or are they completely bad? Oh, about no, it? no. I mean, no one does. I mean, no one does because it hasn't happened yet. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll see what it actually starts to be in point of fact. Very few different products. If you appeal back, you know, it's sort of four companies serving up different colored, you know, gray suits. Um, but, uh, but we'll see. I mean, maybe that's just the start. This is one of these, there'll be a million unintended horrible consequences and there'll be a million unintended lovely consequences. And it really depends on how cynical we decide to be or how, you know, say, well, oh, well, shit, I wish we didn't do it, but now let's try to make it something interesting. And, you know, it just depends on the, mat the, the fashions of the hour over the next three, hour three years. Let's take some questions for Jonathan from the audience, please. There are roving mics uh, and there's someone back here. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> What you're trying to do, I mean, you said you kind of want to bring the internet to the healthcare space. Uh, in general, when you bring transparency to a marketplace, the existing players lose margin, the consumer wins. Uh, how, but you have, how, how are you going to sell? I mean, how can you do that? I mean, right. because your customer is going to lose. And I mean, you know, your customer, the doctor or the insurance company. Well, there's They're, the convenient, cons the, 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 it's tragic, but convenient that, the consumer can't actually win under the current environment. Only the doctor who shops for the consumer can win. The consumer has their premiums taken from them and then they, they get what they get and they don't get upset, as my children's mother likes to say. Um, so the first shopping will go on among caregivers trying to divide up the bounty in different ways. That will lead to the birth of this thing that we have in the rest of society called product management, which we don't have in healthcare. Right? I'll guarantee this hip replacement. I'll do it for half the price and I'll pay for the airfare. If you fly, you know, what should partners do? Should they keep trying to jack the price up? Every no, they should be doing the things that they're amazing at for more than the people of Eastern Massachusetts. And they should pay for the airfare and they can make a lot of money charging less for complicated care, you know? So that kind of product management doesn't need the demand curve to, awe to awaken completely across healthcare. It could just be a demand curve within 
caregivers that have risk contracts. And, and the ACA, uh, the, the Obama administration did allow sort of some upside for shopping in Medicare, which is a new and exciting uh, uh, thing if you become an ACO, um, which a lot of our clients are becoming because they want to profit by shopping. I don't want to just profit by raising the price and raising the utilization because it doesn't feel good and I actually fancy myself as a doer of good. That's why I went into healthcare. Most people do, right? So the idea of making money by shopping, by finding people who are going to be admitted and catching them first, maybe through output from their Bluetooth, YouTube, iPhone, yada, yada, you know, that's exciting to our clients. And the idea that they could actually make money doing that by squeezing someone downstream of them, and, you know, squeezing the ambulance company, squeezing the hospital, squeezing the emergency room, and keep that money. That's, e even hospitals are excited if they're, not, if they're not the most expensive one in town because they think they can steal stuff from the more expensive guy down the road and repack, you know, <clears throat> I'm gonna serve a wider number of people on the same fixed cost, you know, fixed asset base and keep more profit. And that captures their imagination. They get excited, it's information intensive, which means I get to play which I love being included at the big, big kids' table. Uh, and so that's the way I think it works. You're absolutely right. It's not going to be the usual shopping, and so I'm protected from the obvious conflict of interest that you're going to, that someday will kill me, hopefully. Let's give some other people some chances to provoke you. Um, over here, please. Hopefully you'll be killed, the guy who succeeds me, and I will have long since gone off on a sailboat or something. Um, yeah. Here, underneath the boom. Um, yeah, sorry. sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, hey. As you're sort of building this internet of healthcare, what yeah. are some of the primary um, privacy and security right. barriers Good that question. you've encountered? Right. And what, what can regulation or policy or other solutions look like? Right. So the, the, the key to the healthcare internet is that it's got to... It's got a sort of a fiduciary, you know, the thing that kills us is you, you have to first do no harm. Well, in every other entrepreneurial venue, you know, companies explode and splatter all over the wall all the time. And that's where you, oh, look at the guy, that guy's guts actually would be really delicious. Let me add that to my company, right? And you can't really do that when people's lives or safety are at stake, right? So the healthcare internet is going to go slower and be lamer than the dating internet, you know, or the shopping for products internet. But... Can we create a playground that's safe enough to allow at least some of that shopping to go on, some of that rising and falling? So HIPAA compliance, you know, everybody's got to get checked out on their security and privacy. The security of the connections, it can't just be anybody. We have an app store. There's eight companies that have made through all the different conditions. There's about 16 that have been cleared, and we one by one move them through. It's depressing. I wish there was, you know, 800 already. There are 800 companies that are interested, you know, but in order to do this, um, we don't just have to have the inclination to be an open system, right? which is huge in healthcare. Everybody else has the inclination to be closed. All the information systems being sold in healthcare are closed, proprietary, don't talk, don't listen, like some doctors I know. Um, and, and so we've, we've got the interest, but the key is to make sure that we don't, in these early days, you know, have a Hindenburg, you know, where we blow up somebody's privacy or, 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 or in some way humiliate or embarrass or, or out uh, and, and then everyone shuts down and, and, and backs away, and then regulation comes in to freeze it, right? So our goal is to over-comply with every regulation and to require these poor little startups who don't have the money to do it to do so with, with sort of subsidized help from us to, to get these products going. And then when the shopping starts to go, I believe there'll be the... You know, my, my thing is, unless there's a constituency that really wants the new healthcare, that wants a cloud-based shopping network for healthcare... When the big guys fall, no one will say, good, let them fall, and the cost will stay the same. It'll just be shifted more to the tax thing. So we got to get it growing, but we have to do it cautiously enough that there's no obvious accidents that, that make people say it wasn't worth it and, and back off. So that's basically the, uh, the healthcare internet is one that is closed, uh, but open to anybody who goes through you know, the TSA, who is willing to get wanded, have their company wanded before they get through. Um, we have time for one more question, um, please. Could you describe for us your definition of the healthcare internet and its relationship to the healthcare information exchanges? So, you know, if you go to a really nice ski resort town, there are these kids that have the clean faces of a private school kid, but the dreadlocks of a rough life, uh, you know, trust funders. <laughs> it's a little bit like the HIEs, you know, they... <laughs> They're federal, they're, they're like, no, we're a venture, we're like in the market and stuff, but nobody has any real incentive to use them unless they're required, so they sort of, sort of pass their gas into the HIE and everyone knows that 
everybody else is just passing their gas into the HIA, so nobody actually uses it. Nobody pays for it, and so they're just slowly atrophying. What's missing with HIEs is some business model that's self-sustaining. So for example, one of the things I got permission from the OIG is the receiver of information is now only within Athena Net, which is crazy. It should be legal universally, and we're working on that, but receivers of information in any other supply chain in the world pay the senders if the information is correct and accurate. Whether it's bank machines, you know, trading banks, equity trades, mortgage originators and mortgage underwriters, supply chain for auto parts, you name it, right? Every supply chain partnership has vigorous that goes back and forth if you get the information that is needed. In healthcare, it's called a kickback. It's against something called a Stark Law. You go to jail for three years, right? So what we need for HIEs, what we need for all exchange is a little lifting of that, just, just enough permission to let a couple of bucks reimburse, because it's not just the technology, right? It's the extra effort of the primary care doctor to get exactly the information that the MRI center needs and in the form that they need it so that they don't need to start over again and do a duplicate and lose the image and incur the duplication that we incur, right? So HIEs in the noun, that we, the proper noun sense, won't be around for long, or if they are, they'll be like, you know, I don't want to say anything, I always think of negative thoughts, you know, public parks that smell like pee, like they're there, you can't get rid of them, but, you know, what I'm looking for is an ecosystem that allows the swapping of, you know, of spit, of wealth, of referral volume. And to get that really going, we'll probably need to make some small regulatory changes. Not, not huge, but, and I think that over time, at some point when the tide goes in and out, or left and right, or blue and red, there'll be someone who will, you know, say, okay, five bucks is allowed to go back and forth so that we can start to have open flow. A healthcare internet should, should, should be one of them. And then by the way, once these things are connected and the, the, the price, if you look at the price of an equity trade, right? When, when pre-internet, you know, a few years ago, maybe, maybe 15, 16 years ago, it was something like six bucks to settle an equity trade, depository trust corporation, the broker, the prime broker, boom, it was like six bucks per trade. We're down to le like, I think it's like 0 0.6 cents or 1.6 cents per trade. Because once the connections were all built and the exchanges were all there, you know, they just got competed down. There was no cost that would keep the, that would keep the price up. So they just dropped and dropped and dropped to the cost of the server in New Jersey, right? So I expect that to go on in the healthcare. But if we keep propping up these trust fund babies and say, no, this is, everyone exchange with Joey here. And Joey comes around and be like, I ain't exchanging with Joey. You know, then it's just gonna keep, it's just gonna keep not happening. So that's how I, I mean, what Athena does is passive aggressively agree to connect to every single HI in the country happily, and we do, and it just goes, it just sort of like, just sits there in a stack of goo, because um, no one uses it, but. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Bush, always provocative, always informative, Thank you. always intelligent. Thank you guys for having Thank you. Me. Thank you. <laughs>